and you saw the title of the sermon, and you went, huh? I understand why. <laughs> that is a Hebrew word, and we're going to talk about that this morning. So, the study of the words in Scripture, Hebrew words, Greek words, all of those things are very interesting. I met a professor at Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas, and in the lecture he gave that I attended, he literally took the English Bible, like this, and read it in Hebrew. I was like, huh? I would get so confused. I would get so messed up. But he just read it like it was Hebrew. That is not for everyone, of course. And we don't have to do that, of course. But it is good for us from time to time to look at some different words and their meanings and maybe how they can apply to our life. The reason is it can enlighten us for a deeper understanding of God. Not so long ago, we looked at what a virgin meant. And it's different in the Hebrew from what the English normally translates it. And it's interesting. But, um, and so words are, it's important to understand words. As we live our lives, we make choices. And the most meaningful choice that we make is how we are going to live our life. We all have to choose how we will respond to a question, uh, to this question, how am I going to live my life? For instance, one of the gifts God has given us is time. And even though he lives outside of time, he's given us time. And he understands that. We cannot store it up. We cannot purchase more of it. Time in life is not a guarantee or an infinite thing. And so we live life year by year, month by month, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, not knowing how much time we have or when it will run out. So the question is, how will you spend the time that God has gifted you? It's important. The Hebrew word that we are going to examine today, I believe, um, can help us to answer this in our lives is mentioned 20 times in the Old Testament scriptures, which isn't a lot when you look at the whole scripture, but it's powerful. The word that we are examining is tohu. It is translated a few different ways in the New Testament or in the Old Testament, sorry, because it is, um, it's kind of like a color with different shades. Take for instance, the color blue. There's sky blue, navy blue, royal blue, light blue, baby blue, teal, ugly blue, slate blue, midnight blue, and you go on and on. You know, you can feel the blues about the whole thing. But it has a lot of different shades. Tohu contains predominant shades of a color also. And the reason that there is six, and for that reason, sorry, there is six words in the English language to catch the entire hue of the day within the context that the, the writer uses it. So we will look at those shades this morning and see why they might be important to us in choosing how we live our life. We're going to investigate how this might be helpful to us in our walk with Christ. We will do that by surveying some Old Testament passages in which the different shades of tohu are used to develop um, our understanding of the word. So we'll start with looking at all of the different meanings of the word, and then we will make an application of that to our lives. Understanding that you do not want to live a tohu life. It's important to understand that. The first shade of the word tohu is translated as worthless or empty and is found in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 21. It says, don't turn away and follow worthless things that can't profit or rescue you, for they are worthless. That is the uh, Christian Standard Bible version. The ESV uses the word empty. The Christian Standard Bible uses the word worthless. All of these carry a part of that, a part of each one in them. 
But this is Samuel's final speech to encourage the people to get back to following God. This shade of tohu here is dealing with anything that is worthless, that is void of anything valuable for your life, and is unsubstantial when it comes to living a life that pleases God. The second shade of the word tohu is found four times in scripture, where it is translated waste or wasteland. Psalm 107 verse 40 says, He pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes or wasteland. Wasteland probably seems to fit a little better in this context as it is referring to a land or a, a thing that is uninhabitable and worthless and for cultivation or growing anything. It is totally unproductive and useless. Um, it's kind of like the Badlands around John Heller. You can't really do much with it. It's the same kind of idea. The third shade of the word tohu is translated as emptiness and is used three times in the Old Testament scriptures. Job 26 verse 7 tells us, He, that is God, stretches out the north over the void and he hangs the earth on nothing. Okay? Literally, Job is saying that there is nothing to hang the earth on. There is, it is out there in space, in emptiness, a space consisting of nothing. There's nothing in it. And, and God just put the earth there, and it's hanging there by his power, by his word, however that is. But it, it, you get the idea of the, the nothingness of things. And then the fourth shade of tohu is translated as formless and is found only two times in the Old Testament scriptures. The most obvious one, and probably the one we all know and can relate to, is Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, which says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was over the deep. This lends to the idea that the earth had no shape or form to it in the sense that we see it now. I don't know, maybe it was just a blob. I, I, I don't know what, but it had no shape or form. And God took it and shaped it and formed it. Okay? And so it was without form. The, the fifth one is translated meaningless. And it's found two times in the Old Testament scripture. Isaiah 40, verse 17 says, All the nations are as nothing before him, and they are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. In the context of this passage, the point of the author is to show that they have no value or no significance in the eyes of God if they are not walking with him if they are not living by his will and in obedience and faithfulness to him. They are of no, it's just meaningless. The whole thing is meaningless. And then the fifth, the sixth one is the, of the shade of tohu is translated as desolation and is found once in the Old Testament. Isaiah 34 verse 11 says, the desert owl and the screech owl will possess it. The great owl and the raven will nest there. God will stretch over Edom the measuring line of chaos and the plumb line of desolation. Desolation indicates something that is in the state of decay or being destroyed. In this context, this is God's judgment on the nations for their sin and disobedience and on Edom in particular because they were the brothers in, or the kinfolk of Israel and Edom helped to sink Judah and to plunder Judah. And so this, this um, came upon them from God. So there are six shades of tohu and what they mean. The application I want to make this morning is a spiritual one and it's related to how we're going to spend our time and live our lives that God has given us. When we look at the shades of tohu in, our, in life, it isn't pretty when we see how devastating 
a life, a tohu life could be. So let's take a look at that. A tohu life, number one, is marked, in one way at least, by the pursuit of empty things or worthless things. Remember, these things are the in, are unsubstantial, they are unsubstantial in our benefit in life. When you examine what you choose as worthy to pursue in your life, you have to ask yourself if that pursuit is worth the investment and the sacrifice you're going to make. People have sacrificed their families at the altar of worldly success because the pursuit they chose took them away from their family or took their focus off of their family and they ended up losing their family. That is not a worthy thing to pursue. That is worthless. People have sacrificed their salvation while pursuing worldly things and, to, and in that end replaced God and were, and with worthless things that couldn't meet their spiritual need. So the warning for us is, as far as tohu is concerned, we don't want that tohu life. Be warned to spend the time that God's given you on things that will benefit your life as a godly person and not worthless things of the world. Another mark of tohu life, a tohu life is one that is wasted or becomes a wasteland. A life that does not produce anything and like some people, like some people say, that's just a waste of skin or it's a waste of life. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells us the parable of the types of soil and he applies it spiritually to the type of heart that a person has. This person's life that is so hard against God cannot be cultivated to change, is, uninhabit is uninhabitable for faith in God, and simply ends up being a waste of life or a wasteland for the things that God desires and designed for our life to be or to inhabit our hearts. And so you do not want to waste your life. Don't want to waste it away. You don't want it to become a wasteland. The third mark of a tohu life is one that is marred by nothingness. What is your life that God would value as something worthy? What is in your life right now that God would value as worthy? You see, if God recognizes that your life is nothing in his eyes, you are living a life worth nothing. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It's nothing. And when you stop and take stock of your life, what does your inventory look like? Do you have millions in the bank that you're trying to hang on to? Do you have worldly power and prestige? Do you have the praises of men? A life that is focused on everything but Jesus and God? And God isn't the full desire of your heart? That's a life of nothingness. It means nothing in the end. The fourth mark of a tohu life is without form or without shape. I made a cup of uh, a cup out of pottery or in pottery class in school, and, and I took it home, and I was all proud of it. I, I gave it to my dad. I was in grade two, I think, and um, and I gave it to him, and he looked at me, and he looked at it, and he said, "What is it?" Looking back, I probably understand why he asked that. He could have surmised a little differently. I didn't have the form or shape of, of it didn't really have that form or that shape of a cup. But I was only in grade two, so give me a break. But if you apply this formlessness, a life of formlessness, to one um, that is living life, and if you end up saying to yourself, have you, ever, have you ever been in that situation where someone says they're a Christian and you look at them and you watch what they do and it has no form of Christianity, what they're doing? That's what this would be. That's the tohu this would be. You know, sometimes we see this in church. There are those that, um, I don't know, they...
they participate once in a while. They'll show up on Sunday if they haven't got anything better to do or more important to do or if it's convenient. They have one foot in the kingdom. They have one foot in the world. There's no shape or form in their life that speaks to the light of Jesus or God in their heart or to conviction of the worldly ways because it's just all like kind of back and the whole thing's all messed up. So there's no form there. Um, and then the fifth mark of a tohu life is one that has no meaning. So it's meaningless. There are so many commercials out there, so many videos, so many all kinds of things bombarding us with, do you want meaning in your life? We can help you have meaning in your life. And the trouble with that is that not one of them look to God. So where are they getting their meaning from? A meaningless life is one that in the end you pass from this world and you're, the life you've lived just ends up meaning nothing. It's meaningless. You just wasted 60 to 80 years for your trouble and for your troubles you get rewarded with nothing because it was meaningless. God wasn't any part of your life. Your life wasn't lived by the des design that you were given to live your life. You have no eternal life. So what was it all for? It was meaningless. You don't want that tohu life. And the last mark of a tohu life is one that is decaying and being destroyed. And it is translated desolation. This is a life that is lived outside of God and is void of anything that has value or spirituality and eventually is destroyed. 1 Corinthians 1 and 18 says, the word of the cross to those who are perishing, those who are decaying and dying, um, the word of the cross, uh, hold, I missed something here. Just a minute, let me get to, I didn't break that out right. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. When we focus on the things of the world that are perishing as being what is worth something to us, we are just simply perishing along with those things. Jesus came to save the perishing, but for that to happen, we have to turn from the world, that is everything that the world is and consists of, and put our faith and our trust in him. Anything outside of that is a life of desolation. So how do we avoid living a tohu life that seems so awful and so devastating? How do we avoid living a life that reaps the rewards of a tohu life? The first thing that we must do to avoid that kind of life is to get our priorities straight. We want to figure out what is important and what isn't important in life. Like Luke often requests, we want to have godly discernment to make the right choices in our lives. When the Lord's body is meeting, is it a priority to you to be there in fellowship? Or do you have more important things to do? When someone crosses your path, is whatever you are doing in such a hurry you have of higher priority than the soul that just passed before your need saving? Is Jesus first in your life? Or is he bringing up the back end just in case you might need him sometime? Is Jesus leading your life? Or are you leading him or trying to lead him? Priorities are one of the keys to not living that, that kind of tohu life. The second thing is that you might consider doing to avoid a devastating life like that is have the desire and will to do the will of God in your life and develop a healthy and strong relationship with him. Walking with God, trusting in him, living for him, having faith in him, and being constant in constant communication with him through prayer through prayer, sorry, is building a strong relationship with God. Jesus often prayed, and he was God in the flesh, but he prayed to God all the time. 
You and I are only flesh, and we dare not try to be the God of our lives. We must let God be God in the relationship and humble ourselves before him and live a merciful and just life with him, just like we discussed in the Beatitude this morning. And the third thing, we sing a hymn called, it, it's hymn number 552, and it's titled, Have Thine Own Way. Everybody know that hymn? Have Thine Own Way, Lord. In that hymn we say, Thou art the potter, and I am the clay. Does your life show that you are act, that you actually believe that? Are you the clay that God is working with and molding into that person that he wants you to be in his kingdom? Then we say, mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting, yielded, and still. You know how hard that is? Waiting on God? yielding and being still it's not an easy thing but we sing that like that's what we are and I pray that we are that because he is the potter and we are the clay and we are waiting for him or we want him to mold us into what he wants us to be so that is the challenge to all of us it isn't easy it isn't always what maybe what even we want but to avoid a tohu life it is the thing needed to be done. How would you like to spend two years of your life making phone calls to people who are not home? A study shows that is how much time the average person spends in their life returning phone calls to people who are not in. Not only that, we spend six months waiting for traffic lights to turn green, maybe more, maybe less, depending on where you live, and another eight months reading junk mail. Not to mention probably the years some people spend in front of the television or on their cell phones or computers and things like that now. But seeing how things done so casually take huge chunks out of our lives we should likely be more careful and aware of what we are busying ourselves with so that we don't live the tohu life. Psalm 39 gives us some perspective. David, complaining to God, says, You have made my days as a handbreadth, and my age is as nothing before you. To an eternal God, our time on earth is about that long. That's all it is. He doesn't want us to waste that. It is one of the most precious commodities we have in this life on earth. Each minute is an irretrievable gift, an unredeemable slice of eternity. Don't throw it away for a brief moment of satisf satisfying some worldly desire. I'm going to leave you with two scriptures. Jesus says in Matthew 16 and 26, for what, profit will it, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Something to keep our mind on. Matthew 6, 19 to 20. Again, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, neither moth, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. That helps us to get the point of not living a tohu life. If we abide by the will of Jesus in our lives, we'll avoid the tohu life. If we can help you with that or with anything else that you're struggling with this morning, please let us know what we stand and say. I've heard your old story.